today thanking you for having answered our prayer that your presence would be felt in this place that you would move among us that's exactly what you have done and so lord um, as we move in to this next section of our service into the section where you use your humble preacher to speak to us through your word lord help us to listen help us to apply Uh, help us to think beyond others but to think to ourselves to think of ourselves to think of what we need to work on to come with with humble hearts and lord thank you for the fact that we even get to do this today and amen it is good to see you today and uh, a great honor and privilege to get to share god's word with you i was talking with my son yesterday and we were talking about charles haddon spurgeon and he was telling me that he has read that uh, Spurgeon, who preached maybe 3,000 sermons in his lifetime, sometimes as many as 13 a week, told his father at one point, he said, when I get up to preach, I'm still always nervous. And his dad said, that's probably a good thing. So I never preach that I don't view this as a sacred opportunity and responsibility and privilege. And I have already asked God today to use me in each of our lives today, including mine. Uh, We're going to be talking today about one of my favorite passages from the New Testament, John 17, often called the uh, high priestly prayer. Um, We refer to the Lord's prayer that we find in Matthew 6 uh, as the prayer we often think about when we think about when Jesus gave us some example of prayer. But uh, really, that was more of a model prayer. What we're looking at today is Jesus' example of prayer and what our prayers should reflect and include. We're going to be reading each passage, or most of the passages, from John 17 as we talk through. But I want to start by talking about blue bloods. And I know some of you biblicists here are going, I thought this was from God's Word. But how many of you like Blue Bloods, the series, right? I see a number of hands. And uh, you know, everyone ends with the family meal. And when the family meal, before it starts, what do they always do? They pray. 
And I don't know about you, but uh, it's not a real impressive prayer because it's sort of a rote Catholic prayer. And if you're Catholic or have Catholic background, I don't mean that as a mean negative thing, but it's always the same prayer they pray. But I'm just thrilled to have any program on TV where a family is praying. So uh, I just thought I'd throw that out. That was free. For that matter, the rest of it's free as well. But at any rate, uh, I believe that what Jesus in this passage makes priorities in prayer should be our priorities in prayer. Uh, maybe as a Christian, you just be honest with yourself right now and you would say, I struggle in prayer. Um, I think we all do at some point. I heard many years ago something that's impacted me, and I want to share it with you. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, another preacher, pastor type guy, said there are reasons why we don't pray. And this is what he said. Concerning prayer, he said, prayer is the first thing we talk about, but the last thing we do. Have you ever been guilty of someone asking you to pray and you said, I'll pray, and the next time you saw them, the first thing you thought of is, I never prayed. Um, prayer is one of those kind of things for Christianity and the Church of Jesus Christ where we all know we should do it and we all talk about it and we all would agree it's important, but we struggle with it. So it's the first thing we talk about, the last thing we do, but you know, the reasons why that's true is because of our lack of obedience and our lack of discipline. And God calls upon Christians to be obedient to God's word, and we're enjoined many times by the word of God to pray. And we're to be disciplined. I love the passage in Philippians 6 and 7 that says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known to God. But my friend years ago said there's another reason why we don't pray, and I really think he's nailed it here. He said, we don't really think we're doing anything when we pray. And I think that's especially true for those of us that live in the West and in America. We have this American action-oriented culture. And uh, we believe that if something's important, you need to take charge and you need to be about it and you need to do it. So there's just something about praying, even though we would all agree. We, we know God hears our prayers. We know God moves heaven and earth to answer our prayers. But really, we don't believe that. We don't think we're doing anything when we pray. I believe as we look to John 17, we're going to see that Jesus, when he prayed, he believed he was doing something. And there's nothing in our Christian walk that we're more about accomplishing good and about doing something than when we pray. And I hope we'll come to see that and believe that. Years ago, in the recession of 1974, yes, I am old. You, you did the calendar, right? I remember in that recession, I had lost my job. I worked in business at the time, and uh, I was laid off from my job. And I was registered, I think if I remember right, with 22 personnel agencies. And my next door neighbor, who was not a believer, he saw me going out the door one morning, and he said, hey, how's the job, job search? Did I lose it? I'm here? We're good. My neighbor said, how's the job search going? And I said, well, it's it's going, it's, uh, I haven't gotten a job yet, but uh, I'm really praying about it. And I remember his response. He said, well, it can't hurt. <laughs> we don't want to be like an unbeliever that believes that about prayer, it can't hurt. So we're gonna talk about five priorities of prayer today that Jesus emphasized from this passage. So follow along with the screen when I read from uh, John 17, one through four. After Jesus said this, and I'm gonna pause there and let you know that Jesus was preparing his disciples for his upcoming crucifixion. And this prayer is the context of what Jesus was doing with his disciples. So after Jesus said this, referring back to the previous chapter, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the time has come. 
glorify your son that your son may glorify you for you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him now this is eternal life that they may know you the only true god and jesus christ whom you have sent I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And I'm going to read verse 4 again. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. So our first priority of prayer today is completing his work. Verse 4, Jesus said, and remember, he's coming to the very end of his life. Uh, He is probably about 33 years old. Uh, He has spent three years in ministry, uh, pouring into the lives of 12 men. Uh, He has done many miracles. He's preached many sermons. He has just been busy about God's work, and he comes to the end of his life, and he says, Father, I brought you glory by completing the work you gave me to do. Jesus tells us that his way and his plan of pleasing and glorifying God the Father was completing the work God gave him to do. You see, prayer is God's means to direct the course and detail of our lives and our actions. I would certainly want to acknowledge the first way that happens is God's word. We follow what his word has taught us and teaches us about what pleases God, what God's intentions are for us, what we are to do and what we are to not do. But the second part of knowing what we're to do in our lives, what our actions are to be, what the course of our life, the details of our life are to be about is prayer. It's interesting that Jesus did not heal every person when he was on this earth. He did not even reach every person with his message. He didn't right every social wrong. But when he comes to the end of his life, Jesus' life was spent accomplishing the work the Father gave him to do. When I came to this passage and God gave me some insight in this years ago, it changed my life. Uh, I don't know what kind of person you are, but I'm a real task-oriented person. Uh, My wife accepts it and she loves me, but it drives her crazy. I'm real task-oriented. And Jesus could have said all kind of things here, but it's interesting that what he did say was, God, I've done what you gave me to do. So how do you as a Christ follower know how to live your life? How do you know what God wants you to do today? Our lives in our days should be about doing what God's Holy Spirit assigns us to do. When we end each day and ultimately when we end our life, the question we need to be able to answer is have we completed what He has assigned us to do? Is that how you live your life? Being a task-oriented person, I'm aware that God's not so concerned that I finish everything today on my to-do list, but that I finish everything today that's on his to-do list. That should be the way that we live our lives. About nine months ago, uh, Joyce and I were walking in our neighborhood. Uh, We try to walk together five days a week. Uh, about two and a quarter miles for exercise but it's our time of prayer and we pray for people so even though we're walking and praying and even though I know that's the most important thing I confess to you that typically I already know what I'm going to do when I get back home I know what's on my list that day whether it's a verbal list or a mental list or a written list and so we're walking that day And if I recall, I was thinking, you know, we need to get our 45 minutes in here because I need to get to this. And here's a neighbor walking his dog. And uh, we nod to him. Uh, We had met him before down by his house. He was by ours at that moment. But we stopped and just said, how are you doing? What's happening? 
and he says, so-and-so told me that you're a Christian minister. And I said, well, yes, I'm retired. He said, well, that didn't matter. And he said, can I ask you to pray for something? And he proceeds to tell me how his wife is dying of cancer. And I said, Mark, we would love to pray with you for her. And we prayed right there. Since then, we have seen him many times, and we ask him. I've given him my number, and I tell him, you know, feel free to text me if there are any updates and all. And we've been praying for him. I share that to say, you see, that wasn't on my agenda that day. And when I saw him, I think I thought, this is going to delay our walk. <laughs> but God had given me that assignment for that day. I love what the Edens say about their journey here to go church. As we did our investigation and vetting of Bill to be a pastor elder, uh, we asked him about his life and how he lives it. And one of the things that they have both shared about their life in coming here is that they believe that they're on assignment for God. I love that phrase. Uh, Vicki didn't know when she came she was going to end up being our ministry assistant. Uh, Bill didn't know when he came he was going to end up being a pastor elder if you affirm him in that on October the 1st, and I'm sure you will. But you see, they believe that God led them to Richfield and that each thing God has put before them has been an assignment from God. I think they understand this passage. And I just want to remind you that uh, this is important. Doing in your life and even in this day what God has assigned to you as a Christ follower. This principle will change your life. It's changed mine. And I hope God will use it to change yours. Well, there's another prayer priority we're going to talk about, and that's uh, verses 11 through 15. Let me read them for us. Completing his work was the first. This is the next one. Verse 11, Jesus says, I will remain in the world no longer, but they, and he's referring to his disciples, are still in the world. I'm coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, while I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by the name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction, so the scripture would be fulfilled. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may be full of the measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you will take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. What we're about to talk about here is we're to pray for protection through the power of the name of Jesus. This principle will also change your life. Every believer can pray for God's protection and guarding from sin and Satan and harm. It's amazing that Jesus prayed for us. Doesn't that humble you as a Christ follower to know that God incarnate when he was on this earth, that he prayed for us, all the believers for all time. He lifted the prayer for them to his Father. I pray this prayer of protection have for many, many years for my family, for my wife, for fellow Christians, for God's church. Uh, I encourage you to, to pray this prayer. There is great power in the name of Jesus. Just like saying prayer is important, we would all say, oh yeah, great power in the name of Jesus. Do we really realize when we pray for protection in the name of Jesus, what takes place? There is power in that name. You see, through the power of the name of Jesus, we are saved from sin and its eternal consequences 
hell. By the power of the name of Jesus. By the power of the name of Jesus, we have the chains of sin and addictions broken. You may be here today, and if you're honest with yourself, you don't want to confess it to maybe others, but you have an addiction in your life. It could be many, many things. But if you're a Christ follower, know that Jesus, by his name, has already given you the power to see that broken and those chains broken from your life. Through the power of the name of Jesus, demons flee. And I want to remind you that at the ultimate outcome of this world, when God culminates history, the power of the name of Jesus will rule. We learn this in Philippians when we read in Philippians 2.9, Therefore God exalted him, that is Jesus, to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess in heaven and on earth and under the earth that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I know we live in a world where it appears that uh, few people bow at the name of Jesus that few of us submit our lives to him. But rest assured, one day, every single being will recognize the power of the name of Jesus. In the 60s, Bill Bright came out with a wonderful little gospel track called The Four Spiritual Laws. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Uh, the four spiritual laws, the first law is God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, but I want to convey something else to you today. Satan hates you, and he has a dastardly plan for your life. The power of the name of Jesus can change that plan. I want to encourage you to pray for God's power Pray for Go Richfield. Pray for Go East County. Pray for Mark and our staff. Pray God's protection for the next era lead pastor of our church. Pray, pray, pray in the power of the name of Jesus. I'm going to share some personal illustrations today, and they're not to put me forth as a great model of all things, but rather they're the things I know best. And I've learned and been in ministry long enough that I know that personal illustrations typically mean more to you because you know they're sincere. In 2005, I had a wonderful opportunity. I went to Brasilia, Brazil, on a mission trip. That's the capital of Brazil. And I could tell you all about, for the rest of the sermon, the great things that we saw happen and what God did. But I want to tell you about one thing in particular today, and that is that area is full of demonic possession and power. A very dark place. And we encountered that week many examples of that. Uh, I personally encountered it a number of times, but I want to tell you about one time. Uh, during the day, we were out in the communities witnessing and sharing. We had uh, uh, Portuguese interpreters. Uh, I learned how to preach with an interpreter. I really like that, Mark, it's fun. But uh, as we were going about during the days, there was one day when we weren't in Brasilia, they took us and a few of the team members from the church I was part of, church in Gresham, Oregon, now called Pathway, and they took us out to a little community about 30 miles outside of town. The pastor there was bivocational, he was a policeman, and we met with his wife and she took us out in the community and we were sharing the gospel. We went to one home. There was a man there living. He was very gracious. He invited us in, dirt floors. And I walked in, and when we went in, I just felt evil. And we shared the gospel with him through the interpreter, the pastor's wife. 
And uh, I ask him, do you understand what I've told you about how Jesus died for you? How, if you will, will, you can ask for your sins to be forgiven. If you will, you can transfer your trust to him. If you're willing to turn from your sins, he will come into your life and save you, deliver you from sin, give you heaven as your home when you die. And I said, would you like to do that? His face got very white. And he communicated back through the interpreter. He said, I can't pray. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, with greater emotion, I can't pray. And the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart. And I said, may I pray for you? And he said, yes. And as I bowed and prayed, I asked God the Father in the name of Jesus, by the power of his spilled blood, if there was any evil presence in that house, to banish it. And I ended my prayer. And I looked up, and this man has tears coming down his cheek. And he says through the interpreter, now I can pray. And he gave his life to Jesus that day. I tell you, there is power in the name of Jesus. And if you will pray for protection for your family, for your staff, for your church, for your life, for others in the name of Jesus, God will hear your prayer. We live in a fallen world where sin abounds. It doesn't mean we won't be affected by sin. It brings death. It brings, it brings illness. And it's been happening since Adam and Eve. But God has said that there is protection in the power of the name of Jesus. The next passage we want to read is John 17, 16 through 19. Jesus said, they, meaning his disciples again, are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself that they too may be truly sanctified. The point we're making here is that sanctification is by his truth. Let me give you a good definition of sanctification. I probably got it from someone else. I don't remember, so I'm not plagiarizing it. Definition of sanctification is simply this. It's to be set apart for God's possession and use. To be set apart for God's possession possession and use it's one of those 25 cent words we use it a lot in church most of the time we don't have a clue what we're saying but it means we're letting God sanctify us or set us apart for his possession and use Jesus constantly said when he was here on earth that he was here to honor God his father and to do God's will therefore we must have this same devotion and commitment to follow Jesus Christ with our whole life. You see, as wonderful as it is, if you have become a Christ follower, you have given him your life, you've been saved, as we call it, you've been born again, as wonderful as that is, God's intentions for your life don't stop there. It's wonderful that you're in church today, but that's not enough either. And if you read God's word, that's good. And if you pray some, that's good. But all of that is insufficient to accomplish what God wants to accomplish in your life and mine. You see, he wants us to be set apart for his possession and his use. I know it's confrontive. I know it's challenging. I know right now you may be uncomfortable, but I'm here today as God's minister to tell you that Jesus Christ demands to be first in your life, and he will settle for nothing else. If you are already a Christ follower and he lives in your heart through the Holy Spirit, he will not stop working on to you until he gets your attention and lets you know he must be first. We talk about Jesus as our Lord and our Savior. The reality is Jesus only comes into our life 
through his Holy Spirit, through what he is. He's Lord, he's master, and he demands that we let him have that place in our life. Are you doing this daily? Are you letting him be first? I'll tell you this, you can know it if you are by what you do with your time, by how you respond to your spouse, by the way you lead your kids, by your language, by what you read, by what you watch, by what's important to you. And if he's not number one, all those things I just mentioned, they make it blatantly obvious. Don't you hate it when preachers get personal? <laughs> Please know everything I'm saying to you is coming right back at me. My oldest child, Jacob's a Boeing engineer, was in the Air Force for five and a half years. He's been with Boeing now for 16. He had not been with Boeing very long. One day we were talking on the phone and he told me something that really did speak much to my heart and to my life as a dad. He said, Dad, Boeing is my employer, but my job is to be a missionary for Jesus Christ. My son's not perfect. He fails God just like I do and you do every day, but my son got it. My son understood at that point that God wanted him to be sanctified by his truth, and the truth is the word of God. He understood God was saying, you may spend a lot of time each week working for Boeing, and they may be paying you the money that you live on, but your job is not at Boeing. It's not as an engineer. Your job is to be God's missionary. Now, he does not have a vocational calling. He's not ordained as a pastor. Uh, he didn't preach. Oh, well, that's not true. He does from time to time. But I'm saying it's not about being a Christian minister or being a lay person. It's about that all of us, Jesus prayed, we'd be sanctified by his truth. Two passages from John. I won't bore you with the reference right now, but let me just read them to you. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever, the Spirit. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you the spirit of truth. He will guide you into all truth. We talked about completing his work, about protection through the power of his name. We've talked about being sanctified by his truth. Now we're going to read the section in John 17, verses 20 through 23. My prayer is not for them alone. Again, Jesus is referring to his disciples. He said, my prayer is not for them alone. I also pray for those who will believe in me through their message. Oh, what good news this is. If you are here today and in your deepest heart, you've come to the conclusion that you've never truly given your life to Jesus. You've never truly been born from above, as Billy Graham called it. You've never truly had your life changed by him, and he's come in to be your Lord and Savior. Do you know that Jesus Christ, when he was on this earth, he prayed for you. He said, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message today. As I preach his message, he has prayed for you. He has prayed that you would give him your life because he loves you so. He died for you. What a great, great truth that is. And continuing on, I interrupted the passage to say that. Verse 21, he says, I pray that all of them may be one, Father, just as you and me and I am in you, just as you are in me, rather, and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved me them even as you love me. Jesus prayed 
for the unity of his church. Often that concept's misunderstood. Let me first tell you what it does not mean. It does not mean that we in the church are all to agree about everything all the time. We're all different people. You know how that goes. You get 10 people together, you're going to get at least eight opinions on anything. So it's not about all being of the same opinion about everything. Then what does it mean that God wants us to be one, to be completely unified? What does it mean that he wants Go Church to be unified? It means that we are to be united we are to be one in the purpose of Jesus Christ. It means that we are to be united true to God's word, that we are to be united true to God's heart. His word tells us many things. We know it's his guide for our beliefs. We're to be united in that. And that we're to be not, the united true to God's heart. And what is the heart of God? What is the missional heart of God? That all come to know him. That's where we're united. This passage, verse 23 in particular, tells us that this unity is the key to the lost world knowing that Jesus is real that he is sent by God the Father, and that we, his people, are loved by God as God the Father and God the Son are bound in love. I want to repeat that. It's the key, this unity, to the lost world knowing that Jesus is real, knowing that he's God's Son. This means that as people see our unity, our oneness, again, not our identity being the same in everything, but as he sees our unity in the truth of God's word, our unity in the purpose of God's heart, that several things will happen. One, as Christians are united and focused on God's heart, that is forgiveness and redemption of sin for a lost world, they will be convinced of the reality of our message. John 3.16 says, For God will so love the world that he gave his one and only Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. When we're united in that purpose, the world takes note. Second, it means that the testimony of our love for fellow Christians, for one another, the testimony of our love, even when we're different, even when maybe deep down we don't really like that person that much, but we find we have a love for them because we're one, we're unified in the church. When that happens, our love for one another convinces a lost world that we are disciples of Jesus. Where do I get that? John 13, 35. Notice how interesting almost every reference I'm giving you today. One was out of Philippians, but everything else is coming out of this book of John. John 13, 35 says, By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. One of the greatest travesties in our world today is that so many people that don't go to church and don't know Jesus Christ they don't want to be part of us because they see us bickering and arguing and hating each other that needs to change because that doesn't bear testimony to our unity and the lack of unity is a negative witness i want to give you a personal example today of unity Uh, i pastored a church in ellensburg washington for six years Thought I'd be there a long, 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 long time beyond that. But God had a call in my life, and he changed what he wanted me to do. And he led me to go on staff with the Northwest Baptist Convention, which I had the privilege of coordinating church planning and missions for 
um, about 22 plus years. But I was in Ellensburg, and you need to understand that what had happened the year before I left is I became convinced that God wanted us to start a new church in Upper Kittitas County. I don't know if you know the geography there, but uh, from Snoqualmie Pass on Interstate 90, going from like Bellevue or Seattle over to Ellensburg, Snoqualmie Pass, from there down through three little towns to South Clee Ellum, there were about 6,500 people. This is dated, this is back in about 87. 1987, about 6,500 people lived, not, not a lot of folks. But of that 6,500 people, as best we were able to figure out, you know how many were in a church on Sunday morning where Christ was exalted and the Word of God was preached? Less than 200. And I became convinced God had given me a vision that we needed to start a church there, our church in Ellensburg, not far away. And so I began sharing that vision with some of our leaders. And one of my leaders, and uh, this guy's with the Lord today, but I love this guy. He was a great deacon, and I loved his heart. But Frank came to me and he said, Pastor, uh, remember this is about 1987. He passed, Pastor, do you know that our church did this before? And I said, yeah, Frank, I, I, I knew that. And I said, remind me when that was. And he said, it was 1962. I said, you think it's time to do it again maybe <laughs> and so I began infecting our church with that vision and we came to the place where we actually decided we're gonna start a church up there now you need to understand if you had told this pastor a year prior to our beginning that church that we would have the money to do that I would have said what have you been smoking because we pretty much use the offering every month to pay our bills and to pay the pastor and to the part-time church secretary. But a strange thing happened. When we as a church became unified about the heart of God, i.e. extending the kingdom of God and sharing the gospel with others outside our own little church field, when we became unified about that, a year later, we had the money. A pastor friend of mine says it this way. He said, it's money. If you don't give it, you'll never have it. And if you do, you'll never miss it. And so we started putting a fair amount of money for our size church at the time into that upper county work. And it was coming along. Some good things were happening. We called a bivocational pastor. Have you ever noticed how God's ways are not our ways? And then I was asked to go on staff with the Northwest Convention. And though my wife and I had to try, talk God out of that, tried to talk him out of it for about a week, when we really said, Lord, what are you saying? He confirmed in our heart. This was at the heart of our call. And so I left that church. They were sad. I was sad. But I left that church following the call of God. But what does this have to do with unity? I literally said, God, if I leave this now, that new work is not going to make it. Boy, was I wrong. Because my since I left story for that church was better than I was while I was there story. Now, do I have sound? Yeah. Is it my hand going over there? I don't know. This thing has got a demon in it, I'm telling you. In the name of Jesus. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor. That's right. So we left, but that church carried on that new work. I was never so proud of them. It never missed a step. They continued to be committed to that new work into reaching people for Jesus in Upper Kittitas County. I share that with you to say, that's what it means for God's church to be unified and to be one. We've talked about God wanting us to complete his work, about the protection through the power of the name of Jesus that we have, about being sanctified by his truth, about his church being unified. He prayed for all these things for us. 
Jesus bothered to pray for them and to have it in his inspired Bible. I think it's important. But last of all today, we want to read the, the latter verses of this chapter, talk about them for a moment before we close. By the way, do you know what it means when a pastor says, now in closing, absolutely nothing. So don't get excited that you think we're through. Okay, that was just thrown out. I don't know where that came from. Uh, John 17, 24 through 26. Jesus said, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am, to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you've sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. God prayed that we would know him and his glory and his love. That we would know him and his glory and his love. I want us to talk a little about knowing him. Here Jesus prays for the intimacy, intimacy rather, that he has with the Father would be the same intimate relationship that we have with Jesus. You see, Jesus longs for us to know him fully, to walk with him closely, and to serve him obediently. I want to say that again. Jesus longs for us to know him fully, to walk with him closely, and to serve him obediently. But to know him, you first have to meet him. I'm convinced that almost every congregation on any given Sunday probably has some people there that don't yet know him. Now, I don't have anybody in mind, so if you don't know him yet, I'm not talking about you or I don't know that I am, but I want to say to you that you start your spiritual walk you start your spiritual journey when you come to meet him. And if you're not certain today that you have given him your life, that he is your Lord and Savior, that there was a time when he forgave you of your sins and you transferred your trust from you and your sin to Jesus, I have good news for you. You can do what I like to call Put the stake in the ground today and you can meet him because you see all the other things we've talked about that he prayed for us today. He was praying for Christ followers. And until you know him personally and intimately and have a born again relationship with him, you can't do those things. It's like standing in front of the, the mixer in your kitchen and going, it won't work. What's wrong with it? Gee whiz, it worked yesterday only to realize that you don't have the cord plugged in. So if you don't know him today, I challenge you at the end of the message, I'm going to lead in a prayer. And if God has touched your heart and you know I really don't have the relationship with him that I need, I really have not given in my life, I'm going to ask you to pray with me as I pray and to do that today so Jesus prays that we will be one with him eternally in heaven that we will witness his divine glory I'm looking forward to that he said about the disciples he said uh, uh, Lord let them be where I am he talked about heaven one day we're going to witness his divine glory and I'm looking forward to that I'm looking forward to what God wants to do in our lives. Jesus prayed that the love between God the Father and God the Son would be the love that fills our lives as he lives in and through us through his Holy Spirit. This is what we must seek for ourselves and for others. It's that abundant life that John refers to here, an eternal life in heaven. John 17, 3 defines it so well. We read it earlier. 
Jesus said, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. If you're a Christ follower today, Will you let these prayers that Jesus prayed for you become reality in your life? I hope you will. You are such the, the benefactor when you do. He wants to amaze you with how he will use you and bless you and give you his joy that we read about earlier just a little, though I didn't comment on it. He wants that to happen. And if you're not yet a Christ follower, I encourage you to trust him today. To be your Lord and your Savior. Bow with me as we pray. Father, thank you for this passage. We don't know why the Son of God, Jesus, God incarnate when he was on this earth, would pray for us, but we're so glad he did. Lord, we need every one of these things in our personal lives and in the life of our church. And I pray that we today would be surrendered to make you first and foremost in our life to let you accomplish all that we've talked about today. And Father, I pray for any person here that's not started that spiritual journey. I pray today your Holy Spirit right now might draw their heart. And if you feel God drawing your heart to become a Christ follower, to become a Christian today, maybe you would want to pray right now in your heart as I pray, Lord, I believe you sent Jesus to die for my sin. And today, I want you to know that I need you. Forgive me of my sin. I'm willing with your help to turn from my sin. I place my faith and trust and confidence in Jesus Christ to become my Lord and Savior. Come live in my life. I give it to you now in the holy name and by the power of the name of Jesus. Amen.